Oh, the system's slow this morning. Okay, that's the recording started. So just the usual reminder that if you don't want to be recorded, if you don't want to be on the recording, oh, something else coming in. Um, just don't say anything just now. You're welcome to ask questions as always during the lecture. But if you come in, I'll also ask afterwards once we'll stop the recording. So if you don't want to be recorded, please just don't come in just now. But otherwise, you're more than welcome to chip in at any point. OK, so. As I was saying last week, I started off by talking about governance in its general terms. What it was, why it was a good thing. What I want to do this week is to start looking specifically at how um, governance and a governance structure may exist within an organisation. So I also mentioned last week that um, one of the issues that we have in terms of governance, not always because I do have some documents for you, but one of the, the things is commercial organisations aren't very keen on sharing their internal documentation. They tend to see it as a commercial secret. So often what I'll use is public sector documents. So that's what you're going to see a lot of today. So I've specifically chosen uh, a council. And the reason I've chosen is it happens to be my local council, so it, it's easier for me to relate it and hopefully to help you relate it to what's going on. Um, and I'm going to, the plan is to go through all of those and give you an idea how their governance is set up, not just with, um, not just within that organisation, but also how that is distributed to the stakeholders. And in this case, there's lots of different stakeholders, including um, the people who live in North Ayrshire, the um, people who do business in North Ayrshire, the suppliers, other governments, other local government organisations, health boards, anyone else who is um, in any way connected how the organisation works, how it is going to be governed, how that's all going to work, is all, um, all has to be given to all these different organisations. So we've got a, a lot of different documents that allow us to do that. And now that I've stopped filling because my Acrobat has started, I can start showing you what I mean. So what I've done is I've chosen some documents, not all of them, some documents, um, to give you an idea of the sorts of ways that governance might be brought in and how it might work. So first thing I want to show you is this bit up here. Governance for this organisation isn't just internal. Governance is about a, a wider thing. It's about how you bring in other organisations and for a council it's called community planning partnership. So that might be local health boards, police, fire, um, third sector organisations, it might be local businesses, tourism. All of those things are part of community planning and it comes into part of the governance. What you're looking at is the agenda for the North Ayrshire Council. And I, as I said before, when we were looking at those triangles, that for local government, the, the governance starts with the council. And that's, that's the, the uh, body that sets the aims and how the the organisation is going to go. So 
as part of that, the other uh, organisations with which the council works, people are sent. So this board will not include everyone who is on the board or the council, but it will include delegates to it. So people will represent the council on this community planning partnership. So it's their job to go there and represent the council, to represent their views, and then to bring that back to the full organisation. And that's what this item seven does. It brings that external stuff into the organisation. And you can see in item eight how that works. In this particular case, it's not the CPB, it's the IJB. And I spoke last week about the provision of health and the provision of social care. Before they were very separate organisations, now they've been brought together um, so that there is more close working between those that provide the health services, the health board, and those that provide the social services, which is the council. So here we've got item eight, where people on the council have been appointed to this integrated joint board. So not everybody in the council turns up, but people who represent the council go onto this joint board and they will learn about the health provision, but also be able to give input in terms of the social care provision and then bring those together to make them work. And there'll be similar uh, documents on the health board side about who will be attending for them. Similarly, there's other outside bodies. In this case, however, yeah, you're a wee bit blurry there, Nicola. I really do like having your camera on because I really like it to know that you're here, but if you if you turn off your camera, that usually helps in terms of connection. So yes, yeah, more than happy for you to keep the camera on, but if it, if it helps you, please turn it off. But if anybody else wants to turn the camera on, please do. It makes it feel a bit more, oh, there's Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Um, so here's another outside board, an outside appointment, but in this case, it's not the uh, councillor who's appointed. So it's not at that top of the, the triangle, it's that middle part of the triangle. So here we've got an officer going to this board to represent the council. So again, they've thought how th this governance should work. And they've decided that for IJB, that needs a high strategic input. For this DBFM board, and it actually doesn't matter what DBFM is, they've decided that it's actually more about the implementation. So they've taken people from the implementation level, in this case, the head of physical environment, who represents, because they're clearer on how that works and the nuts and bolts of it. So we're starting to see different ways of governance being put together. We've got a governance of the council, which is the councillors. We have got representatives from that going on to other organisations to speak to other organisations to understand how they work and to ensure that the aims come together, because it would be quite nice if, um, you know, police, fire, charity and public sector all work together. Isn't that better than everybody going their own way? So you have these joint things where people come together to try and uh, make things better. So sometimes it's from the strategic view, sometimes it's from the implementation view. And that will depend who then goes on. Everyone happy with that so far? OK, so next thing I want to talk about is the we, we talked last week about this idea about setting uh, a vision for an organisation, strategy, where we're going, what's going to happen. For this organisation, that's called the council plan. You know, 
hugely unimaginative, but at least you get the idea. What is the council going to do? And that's what uh, is coming up here in agenda item 10. By the way, if you're ever invited to join a board, 148 pages of documentation that you are expected to read and understand before you even get into that meeting. And that's quite a light agenda. I checked the last one for this was 588 pages. OK, so here is the. Council plan. And it starts off firstly by sending a report to the board, to the council. So part of the reason I bring this up is because your document that you're creating will have these kinds of things in it. So remember I said there is going to be a, a part where you give your recommendations, what you think you should be doing. But then there's going to be a part where you give all the explanation of why that's your recommendation. And you can see that type of layout mirrored here. Now, let me be really clear. This is just one way to do it. So I am not saying you have to do it like this or you will be wrong. This is how one organisation does it. Later on, I'll show you another organisation and they have slightly different layouts and a slightly different approach to it, but it's still the same idea. It talks about what it is your, the document is uh, going to explain. So in this case, it's about the council plan, what the council thinks it should be doing, and you'll see it's quite a broad one. It's a five year plan. So that's not something that you're going to do tomorrow. It's thinking about the broad strategic aims. So again, we're back to governance, thinking about what's the strategy? What is it this organisation is going to do? But it's not just about that because we need something to make that happen. So this document is talking about the broad aims at the top of that triangle. And then it's also saying the supporting delivery arrangements. So that's the next bit down in the triangle. And we also spoke about how we know what we're doing, how we measure whether what we're doing is right or not. And that's that third part there, the performance management. We said we are going to do X. Did we do X? And if so, did we reach our target? Did we exceed our target? Did we not make our target? So it's about all of these things. Where are we going? How are we going to do it? And how are we going to understand whether we got it right or not? I also spoke last week about governance, including uh, governance being for all of the stakeholders. And you'll see here that there is a, an explicit reference to how this document was created. And it's saying we spoke to people. Responses to consultation. So all the stakeholders for this organization were consulted about what they think the organization should be doing, what they think the priorities are, where the, where the um, most need was identified. So there's clearly what the organisation wants to do, but there's input from other stakeholders. That then comes into a whole bunch of recommendations. Now, this is page 49 of 148 for this item. And the next item on this agenda is at page 103. In other words, there's more than 50 pages for this agenda item. But the actual 
this is what we are going to do part is half a page. Here's the recommendations, what we are going to do. But after that, there's another 50 pages of this is why we think we're going to do it, and here's how we're going to set it all up. And again, that's part of what I was talking about in terms of the assessment. The recommendation, so that they can see what very quickly about what you think they should do. But later on, lots of explanation about that, about why that has been the recommendation. I'll not read out those recommendations. You can see that there's seven of them there, and they all apply to this particular item. And then the, the paper goes on to talk about what's, how this was developed. An overall summary. We're going to make a plan. Why are we making a plan? What's the background to making a plan? Well, clearly you want to do stuff. And again, we're back here to this mission statement that we talked about last week. And here we'll get a very clear mission statement to improve the lives of North Ayrshire people and develop stronger communities. Very clear. Help the people that live here and help them live together. What's our vision? To be the best at that, because clearly there's lots of uh, local government areas. We want to be the best. We want to provide an excellent service and we want to innovate as well. We don't just want to be stuck in the same old stuff. Now, as you can imagine, there's lots and lots of things that this organisation does. And again, I'll make the caveat, this is for local government, but you can think about it for any organisation. If this was Apple, its strategic priorities might be to grow its server uh, market or to uh, grow its iPhone market. If this was GlaxoSmithKline, it might be to increase their exposure in uh, the retail drug market. It just depends what the organisation is, what it does, what its aims are, what these priorities might be. So these priorities are what they've decided that this organisation should do. But you'll get the same sorts of things elsewhere. And again, they're, they're not a surprise. They want a bigger economy. They want more people employed. They want the towns regenerated, that kind of stuff. And the other thing you can see there from section 2.3 is this is ongoing. So it's a, it's a long plan, it's five years, and a lot can happen in five years. But it's continually renewed. So this council plan didn't come together in five minutes. This would have been the result of maybe 18 months work to get to this point. So in other words, the previous council plan would exist. Halfway through that, they would start thinking about what the next council plan is going to be and start talking to people about how to create that so that by the time the first plan is finished, you're ready for a new one to come back in. It then starts building up evidence about why they have created this document as it is, about the consultation, who they've spoken to, why they've spoken to them. It's not just about getting people's input, it's about saying, well, if we don't have if we don't consult and we don't have their input, then we also won't have their support when we try to implement this. So it's important to have that. And then it starts giving out some figures, some statistics on what people thought when you asked them. And it tries to give an idea so that when you're making the decision, you have a a, a clear understanding about whether this worked. So they're saying, OK, there, we had 4,000 people coming to this website to give their thoughts. And then it's up to the people who are reading this paper to decide, is 4,000 OK? Is it not enough? Is it whatever? So that gives the background. It talks about how other organisations were involved. And then it starts talking about, in more detail, 
about the proposal. So remember the recommendation where we accept this plan. We go ahead and do this plan. So what actually is this plan? And that's where it starts talking to. And again, we have a vision, we have a mission. And it starts thinking about what the themes are. It goes into more detail about economy and about people and about all that other kind of stuff. After it's done that, it goes into more detail about the delivery and performance framework. There's no point having a vision if you have no way to implement it. And it's very important when, and I mentioned this last week, it's very important when you have governance in place that the aims are achievable. You want them to be testing. So you don't want to say, ah, you're all doing fine, just keep going. You want, you want to get better. Of course you want to get better. But there's no point in saying, if you're Apple, well, we will double sales by next year. It's just not going to happen. So you say things like, we will increase our iPhone revenues by 10% and our iPad revenues by 5%. We will cut our customer service delay from 30 seconds to 25 seconds. We will increase our customer response surveys from 22% to 24%. And we will hope to move our satisfaction from 75 to 85%. Whatever makes sense for the organisation. Some of them will be similar. There'll be lots of organisations who want their customer service to get better and faster. But there's only very few organisations. Well, there's one organisation that will say we want to sell more iPhones. So it will depend on the organisation, what its aims and plans are. So here they're talking about how this is actually going to work. How are you going to do this? And one of the things that you'll see spoken about quite a lot is this idea of a golden thread. How does it get from the top of that triangle? We want to do this down to it actually being implemented and working. And one of the ways that happens is that there has to be a clear link. We want to do this. These are the people that are going to implement it. They are going to deploy these resources to make that work. And this is how we will measure. And it's important that you set that measurement before you start. You say what you think should be the outcome before you start the work. Because otherwise, it's very easy to get to the end of a project and go, oh, yeah, that worked. Oh, you yeah, were absolutely fine. Not a problem. You have to decide what your success looks like before you start the project. Otherwise, it's far too easy to kid yourself on. OK, so we have that part. Um, talks about how that is going to be um, governed in terms of who looks at these plans. So we have KPIs, key performance indicators. We spoke last week about uh, the people responsible for governance sometimes splitting up to take different functions, perhaps because of their own background, their own skills, their own interests, and also partly to have a, a way of approaching everything. So you may have a bigger board, but they'll split up into smaller parts. And you can see that happening here. There is here a delivery plan and a performance management framework. This is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to measure it. So who looks at that? Well, in this particular case, it's something called the Audit and Scrutiny Committee. They actually scrutinise, it's there in the name. We will scrutinise what went on to make sure it's happening. And they'll look at all sorts of things, including finance. 
And here's some changes that they're going to make. We think we need some changes in this implementation model. Um, under the new structure. So this council plan isn't just saying, here's what we're going to do, it's how we are going to do it. There is a new structure, there are two directorates. And again, it doesn't matter what the directorates are. If, if it was pharmaceuticals, it might be a, a retail division and a hospital division, or a, a, however you put that, a public sector division. Here they're saying we're going to have two. They're also identifying what we'll start talking about later on in terms of compliance. Some of their content can be driven by the needs of external regulators. Sometimes you don't get the choice. Sometimes you just have to do what the law says, what other organisations tell you to do, whatever it may be. You are, there are always frameworks within which you have to work. And that's acknowledged here in that. It also acknowledges possible issues with how this might work. A danger of using directorate plans. So they said there's going to be two directorates. They've said they're going to make directorate plans. But they're also saying, well, maybe that puts the focus not on the overall aims of the organisation, but on the aims of those parts of the organisation which have plans. And maybe that's not the best ways to work. They were detailed. They tried to present them more accessibly, but there was limited interest in them. So they're acknowledging things that went wrong before, pointing out where the issues are and saying, well, maybe we could approach this in a different way to try and make that work better. So the reporting framework needs to be clear, focused and accessible. People need to know what's working. And this is a particular concern in the public sector. But again, for a private sector, uh, you might have to do the same sort of thing. You might have to produce a report for your shareholders. And the shareholders report might also, should also be clear, focused and accessible. So that people understand what the organisation is trying to do and understand whether that happened or not. And emphasising my previous point, they use very um, conciliatory language. There can be a cluttered landscape. In other words, there's all these competing things, directorate plans, statutory plans, national plans, key performance indicators, benchmarking frameworks, all that kind of stuff all has to come in and all has to be uh, put into the pot to all work because some of the things you have to do in the same way as a private company would have to give uh, its accounts to a public organisation. Oops. <laughs> oh boy. Well now, isn't that fun? Stop it, you. Um, see this working from home stuff? What can happen is a cat can wander in. And I have a wee, um, I've got a, a wee accessory under my desk. It's a couple of wee pedals that let me go up and down and press buttons so that I can work stuff here and work it with my feet. If the cat decides to lie in those pedals, that can be an issue. Sorry about that. Where are we? Uh... We're all still alive, Tony. We're OK. <laughs> Just shows that I'm live as well. This wasn't recorded. <laughs> wonder how I cut that out of the recording of this. <laughs> oh, dear. Come to UWS and learn about cats. 
Somebody will say that the cat's the best part about it. Right, OK, where were we? Yeah, so that's cluttered landscape. There's a lot of things going on and um, we need to make sure that all of these things happen, but also that they don't stop us getting to our aims. So there needs to be a clear understanding of what those aims are and how they're working, whether we're getting to that point. So even though it's a five year plan, you don't say, OK, we'll see you in five years and tell us how you go on. Of course not. You have to decide on a reasonable reporting structure, and that will be different depending on what it is you're governing. So if it's a, a shop, if it's a retail outlet, you probably want weekly, if not daily reporting on how well the shop did. How much did you bring in? If you are a hospital, you want daily, if not hourly reports about the wait time at A&E. It will absolutely depend on what the, the project is and what you need to do to keep on track with it. Here for this one, they're saying, OK, this is a, a long term plan. So we will come back and we will get a report on this once a year. Now, that doesn't mean that the only report that happens is once a year. This is just for this council plan. All the other delivery bits, there would be more frequent reporting depending on what's appropriate. But for this council plan, once a year. And there'll be two different parts. So the board will look at it. In this case, the board is called the cabinet. So every six months, the delivery plan will go back to cabinet. So again, this is a high level stuff only every six months because we're not expecting too much to happen. And it won't just go to cabinet, it will go to audit and scrutiny committee who will look at the KPIs, who will look at the finance, who will look at whatever they want to look at. And we'll look at the progress and later on I'll show you some of the KPIs and how the, the progress is indicated. And it will be part of their job, as I said last week, to scrutinise these, to ask questions, hopefully sensible questions about what's been going on. And. Decide whether or not action needs to be taken in order to to fulfill the plans. So you'll see that the framework is in a whole different document, Appendix 2. And again, coming back to your assessment, I've suggested that you might want multiple appendices just to make it easy to um, to understand the document rather than having it all one big report. Sometimes it's easier to say, OK, if you want to know about this, it's in this particular document in this appendix. If you want to know about that, it's in a different appendix. But again, different organisations work in different ways, and I don't want to be prescriptive in what I'm saying in terms of your assessment. In this particular one, the performance management framework, this is our target, this is what we want to hit, is in a document and it says they're going to look at that progress and match it against their actuals over the lifetime of the plan. Um, OK. As part of that, so again, the, the reporting isn't just five years for a five year plan. Here they're going to report annually. For a performance framework, how have we done this year? And they've also pointed out that how the report is important. You have to be able to understand the information. It has to be helpful. It has to be understandable. And they haven't just said we're going to do the performance framework. They've explicitly pointed out we've looked at this. We wanted to make sure it was still OK. And they've just concluded that it is. It is still fit for purpose. They're also talking about um, influences, internal and external audit and scrutiny. And again, 
this is all about local government, but the same thing can apply in other organisations. If you're a charity, the Charity Commission will want a report every year about how you've spent your money and the percentages of money that went to charity is against percentage of money that was spent on delivery, on chief executives remuneration, that kind of stuff. If you're a, a retail company, you will produce audited accounts at the end of the year. They will go in as part of your a requirement to put those into company's house to show that the, the company is still working or not. And they've also been very clear that part of what they're doing isn't just looking at it in isolation. They haven't just said, oh, well, this guy only care about us. They're saying, well, actually, there's other people doing similar things. In this case, we have a national performance framework. Shouldn't we be making sure that we're at least as good as other people in this sector? That, aren't, that we are doing at least as well as they are. So there's a national performance framework that allows you to compare that. So that's all the information that's then given to allow the board to make a decision. Now remember these papers were distributed early, so you'll they'll be at least say a week beforehand, which means that if there are any questions on this, you can follow them up before you get into the meeting. And here specifically it says for further information, here's who you'd contact. Here's your first contact if you have any queries about what's going on here. So you'll get those, you'll read through it, you'll try to understand, you'll ask the questions where necessary. And finally, you get the proposals. Here's what we're going to do. And it's talking about all those things that we just talked about in detail. And they're just summarised here. It also talks about what might happen if you do this. If you suddenly said, Right, we're going to have twice as many uh, people serving behind the counter in our shop. Well, great plan, and it will be fantastic in terms of customer service. But there will be financial implications. It will cost you twice as much in salaries. So the implications are also clearly recognised under some different headings and again the headings may be different for different types of organizations but some of them will be the same everybody wants to look at the financial implications of what you're intending to do of course you do everyone wants to understand how it will affect the people that work in the organization whether there are any legal issues with what you intend to do and because we work in a, a wider framework we might have to look at equality laws we might have to look at children and young people laws. We might have to look at environmental issues. So it is very clear about the types of um, implications that will come out of what you're intending to do. And that's just the first bit. So that's the paper that says what we're going to do. It's laying out the governance. It's laying out how things are going to be reported. And then it starts actually showing what that is. So here's the plan. And this is a document that's distributed to people that will be affected by this. We talked last week about vision. And they are trying to communicate in clear language what the vision is. And what they're going to do, the mission, and they go together. They make some statistics available. And they try to make them available in a, an easy to understand format. 
it's not just about opportunities. 81% were delighted with the customer service they received. It's about challenges. There's an ageing population. And that, as you can imagine, is going to cause issues with healthcare and social services and, and all that kind of stuff. And quite rightly, they also show some of their previous successes. Here's the first, here's places where they were first to do something, where they did the best, not just for them, but everywhere. So if you're Amazon, you can say, we made more profit than anybody else in the world. So it takes through an easy to read language, priorities, what they're going to do under different types of headings. So you'll see that this is about infrastructure, homes, environment. And it says what the plans are for each of these things. So that's the easy to understand council plan. How do they know if they have made those differences that they're hoping to make in the council plan? Will they have performance measures? And you can see here we've got performance measures on specific aspects of their service. Percentage of population who are involved in local decision making. They take where it started from, that's called the baseline, and it was 51%. And they're saying, well, by the end of this plan, can we get another 9%? Can we push it to 60%? And that's part of what I was talking about in terms of making challenging targets, but not ridiculous targets. Because you could say, well, we want everybody who, who's in the local area to be involved in local decision making. We want that to be 100%. And, you know, over time, I'm sure they do want it to be 100%. But can you actually have that? And can you have it in five years? No. So what do we think a challenging but achievable target can be? Let's up it by 9%. Average total tariff score of pupils. In other words, how well do they do in their exams? It's currently 875. Can we push it to 890? And you see similar things for all of these measures. They've said what they are, they've said what they're starting with and what they want to get. So that when this thing is finished, you can see whether you've been a success or not. There's no fudging. You can't come back and say, oh, no, that's what we want meant to do all along. People have clear aims and a clear understanding of what it is they're trying to do and where they're trying to get to. And there are loads of these. Loads and loads. All of these documents, by the way, are in your module materials in the governance section on OneNote. So you can look at them at your leisure. So that was the aims. The next appendix is about delivery. How are we going to do this? Um, and again, I'll just take the first one. We'll build stronger relationships between the council, communities and partners, which is a nice aim. How do you actually do that? OK, we'll establish an engagement and consultation centre. Now, I happen to know this didn't happen. Why? Because it was published in 2019 and nobody got together for the next two years. <laughs> um, they ex we will extend locality planning approach. And I happen to know that did happen even during um, COVID. Locality planning continued. In fact, it became more important because uh, working within localities, people delivered meals and made sure that all people were phoned or contacted and and um, well-being checks were done and that was done within the communities and that worked actually really well even though they had to meet on teams for two years and people get very upset about that it still happened so they're saying here's what we'll do in this column and here's specifically how we will make that happen so we haven't just said, oh, here's an area for your aim. 
Here's an actual plan about how we'll make it work. That plan may or may not stand once it reaches the ground, but that's OK. You come back and you change. If it doesn't work, you examine it and you change. And that's part of the reporting back that we talked about earlier. So we'll come back and say how you were getting on. Is there anything we need to do? So in all of these headings that we talked about and all of these headings that the council decide they're going to do, they say going to do this. Here's how we're going to do it. There's a, a thing in Scotland where. You can access. 1140 hours of free care. For under fives. Which is a lovely aim, great aim. But stuff has to happen for that to go ahead. You need buildings. So it starts talking about they'll create indoor and outdoor learning environments. If, if you're going to have more children for more time, you need more space. You also need more people. And there's a, a recognition that might not always be internal, so they'll build partnerships. Maybe we can get other childminders or other nurseries to come in as part of this. And rather than the organisation doing it all in house, they will partner with other organisations to make that happen. Regardless, there is a plan. Here's our aim. Here's the plan. This is how it will work. And again, pages and pages and pages of this. And pages and pages and more pages and more and more pages. And then we get to the next part. So again, there's a transformation plan. And part of this is talking about issues. It's, it's not a big surprise that there is there are cuts to government funding. And that applies at local and national level. So if we need to do the stuff, how are we going to change the funding environment? We will save. And it shows you how to so to give you an idea that the, the annual spend for this organization is about 480 million pounds a year. And that's revenue and capital. So revenue is kind of day to day paying people. Capital is build new stuff, buy new things. So revenue and capital about 480 million. So they're looking at this stuff and find details so out of that 480 million. What they're saying is we're going to save 36,000 in libraries and community hubs. So it's quite fine detail for some of this. Community learning development, half a million. Old people services. Well, 130,000 one year, but then a million the second and another million the third, adding up to over two million over the three years. So they've identified where they're going to make these savings and they've projected what those savings are going to be. And again, they may or may not survive contact with reality. So that's part of the thing that will come back and the audit and scrutiny committee will say, did you save your 36,000? Well, actually we saved 40,000. Well done, Gold Star. Did you save your 579,000? Ah, no, we only saved 500,000. Oh, OK. How are you going to fix it? What's your next plan? What are you going to change to make this work? And it may be that there is a plan and you change something. And by the way, this is absolutely not anything to do with the actual project or the actual numbers, just in case anybody's wondering. Um, it might be that um, you say, well, actually, we've changed our minds. What we found was if we try and do that, it has this knock on effect to this service, which has this knock on effect. And actually, that's a big issue for the people that use the service. So actually, if you don't mind, can we save that 79,000 somewhere else, please? Or they might come back and say, well, no, we haven't saved it, but actually it's longer term and it's more about um, 
the knock on effects. So we've done something now, but we'll actually see the savings for that next year and the year after. So yes, we didn't do them in year one, but we will use them in year two or year three. So there are different ways that um, you might approach changes to plan because you know plans don't always come in exactly what you would expect. So again, it comes through all of these different parts. And then this final one is uh, we started off saying that it took input from other people, other stakeholders, other organisations. So this is the final bit about who they were. Whilst making it really clear that it's advisory. So this is to get input from other people. But in the end, if you run an organisation, you have to ensure that your organisation works. So yes, get all the input. Yes, get all the understanding about all these things that are going on. But in the end, there's going to be decisions that have to be made. The people who look after one part of the service, uh, children and young people, will want more money to look after children and young people. Quite rightly. The people who look after older people services will want more money to look after older people, quite rightly. But there's not infinite amounts of money, so at some point someone has to say, here is what we are going to do. So you get the advisory exercise, you understand all the issues, but then actually it comes down to the governance to decide how you're actually going to proceed. And you will never please everybody. So it, it covers the, the advisory uh, consultation. And again, it's the same sort of themes to try and understand what people were talking about. So don't give every specific input, but they say, OK, well, lots of people were talking about we need a job. Lots of people are talking about, well, you go into the high street and it's empty. Can we do something about that? So you try and take the, the advice and put it into themes that then will uh, influence how you go about your plan. And then again, lots of these. Any questions about that part before we move on? Not see anything in the chat. Uh, so once it's agreed, there's a plan made and that's distributed. So if you wander into a local library or something, you'll be able to get one of these documents and read it. I think uh, and, uh, this is the one I wanted. Sorry, those three were just the parts that were in that main document. Here I wanted to show you uh, you see it says up there, well, you might not be able to see it, but it says plan A3 poster. So once this plan's been made, they've created posters that can go up onto office walls or onto uh, places where the public will come, which basically says here is what we are going to do. So that people can look at this poster and think, OK, well, that's what the council are wanting to do. Have they done it? So it isn't just about making the decision, it's about communicating that decision. So here we're communicating it to stakeholders, the people who live in this council area. But in other places, you might be communicating it to other types of stakeholder a shareholder, somebody who owns a share in your company, to staff. And in fact, this kind of poster would go up in staff offices as well, just to remind people, here's what we're doing, here's, here's what we're trying to get to. And I know that every day you'll get a phone call, you'll get an email and you get bogged down in the detail, but please try and remember what we're trying to get to through all of that. OK, so that's been an hour. And trust me, I've got more to say. 
but I think we probably need a wee break. What do you reckon? Yeah. So will we take five minutes? Get up, stretch, do whatever you need to do. Yes, thank you, Margaret. OK, we'll take five minutes and I'll see you back here in five.
OK, and we are back. Your wandering cat still under the desk. I can't I can't stretch out at all. I will pick her. Oh dear. It's not even my cat, it's my daughter's cat. How do I see her? OK, so. We were talking about setting a structure, setting aims for an organisation. And I paused at the point where I wanted to start thinking about how that was going to be done. So last week we looked at that triangle that said at the top of the triangle, you're setting a, your aims. In the middle of the triangle, you're setting a, those who will implement that, those who will manage that implementation, how it's going to go. And here we've got a document that aims to do that. It's called the scheme of administration. So, ignoring the first bit, so it's about how committees work and you know how they appoint a chair and all that kind of stuff. Let's look at um, these things from number three on. So remember, we've got a governance board. And for a local council, it's the council. But not all of the councillors will take part in every decision. So they're split up into different things. The cabinet is um, in some ways, it's the executive, so they are the ones who are tasked with taking on the day to day decisions. The other ones, and if you remember that previous paper, it said a report will come to cabinet. And it's saying they will look at what's been happening. They will take the decisions on any changes to be made. And that's a subset of the councillors. It's about six out of 33 or so. Next one, and this is just an alphabetical order. So appeals committee is about staff relationships. So if staff have had any disciplinary issues, they can appeal and there's an appeal committee there. Audit and scrutiny again was referenced in that previous paper. So they will look at uh, aims, KPIs, all that kind of stuff, finance and make sure that everything is happening the way it should be. There are specific committees for specific subjects, so there's an economic joint committee. Um, and one of the things that's interesting here is um, how they've joined with other organisations. So it said here that this is North Ayrshire. There's also South and East Ayrshire. And what they've said is, well, actually, if we're going to develop the economy, maybe rather than just doing it as one block, we can make it a bigger block. It's almost like joining with other places to have a bigger trading area is a good idea. So there's an Ayrshire Economic Committee. So again, some people will be sent to that to advocate on behalf of North Ayrshire. And similarly, from the other organisations, they will also send members. There's a shared services joint committee. If you're driving along a road and you suddenly go from one area to another, well, doesn't it make sense that there's some sort of people talking about how that's going to work? And all the other shared services that you might need, what about a bus? What if you want a bus going from Glasgow to Edinburgh? Well, sometimes buses are subsidised because uh, they can't make enough money otherwise. So who pays if you want a late night bus from Glasgow to Edinburgh or vice versa? Is it Glasgow? Is it Edinburgh? Or do you come together and think, well, actually, it makes sense for both of us. Maybe we can get some something shared. And similar things for all these others. I'm not going through them all in detail, but 
same kind of idea. Education has a committee. Licensing, if you want to open up up. The local development plan, how you think your local area should continue. The local review body, which is if you get a decision from planning and you don't like it. The planning committee itself. I want to put an extension in my house. Is that OK, please? Um, police, fire and rescue, staffing and recruitment, the integrated joint board that we spoke about earlier, and that's for um, health boards, because I know there's some people from health boards in here. So here's how they've decided that this joint board, so I've chosen this joint board because it incorporates governance, not just in the organisation, but across multiple organisations. So this is a statutory body. In other words, there's a lot of legalities around it. Um, it's a It's a partnership between the council and the health board and how that's going to work is actually uh, set down in a document. So they've decided on the governance structure and they've laid that down. And it's something called the North Ayrshire Integration Scheme. So the two organisations have come together and said this is how it's going to work. And part of what they've said is, OK, well, it's a joint working board, so we'll have four people from one side, four people from the NHS side, and four people from the council side. So they've got equal representations on both sides to ensure that both sides points of view are heard. There are deputies. They've also tried to broaden. Membership, so there's a, an interesting sentence here. Council nominations shall be two members and two deputies nominated by the administration and two members and two deputies not by the administration. So you'll probably know that if there's an election, somebody takes over at Westminster, there was an election, more Tories were elected than anybody else, so they have the administration of the government. This sentence rep uh, recognises that even though somebody won an election, other people voted for other people, other parties as well, or other uh, individuals, other independents. So it's saying, OK, so we'll have people who are on the administration, the people that are actually running the council at this point. But to recognise that those other people will have two people from there as well. Committees have chairs. Somebody who's in the chair and runs the meeting. And again, because it's a joint one, rather than having one chair, they're saying, OK, well, we're going to have a chair, but we'll swap it. So every two years it goes from council to health board and vice versa. Most committees also have a vice chair and they're saying, well, if the chair comes from one organisation, the vice chair comes from the other organisation and then they swap. And they also say something very specific. The council appointed chair or vice chair shall be the cabinet portfolio holder for health and social care. So what they're saying is the person who has day to day responsibilities. Remember, I said the cabinet has day to day responsibility for decisions. There will be a portfolio for health and social care. So there's multiple portfolios, just like in the Scottish government, the Westminster government, you have a minister for education and a minister for social care. Here we call them cabinet portfolio holders. So there's cabinet portfolio holders for economy, education, whatever it happens to be. And it's saying that the person who has day to day involvement in this shall be the chair or vice chair. In other words, the person that's most involved with it should take on that role to ensure that golden thread. So it comes from this joint board that goes through the, the um, portfolio holder and from there to the officers who will actually make the stuff happen. So you'll get that line all the way through to make sure that it's not well, someone attends here and someone does this over here, but actually they don't talk to each other. There's that line all the way through. It then talks about how many people you need to turn up. Um, and then 
something called delegated powers. So we've said that these subcommittees aren't everybody, they're just parts of it. So the question then becomes, what powers do they have to actually do things? And you saw with all the different names in those committees, there are certain powers that committees get to do things. So for the licensing committee, they are given the delegated power to issue taxi licenses and, and off licenses and, and pub licenses and whatever it happens to be. For the planning committee, they are given delegated permission to deal with planning issues. But weirdly, only planning issues up to a certain size. So they can do a new house, but they can't do a new power station. And the line is somewhere in between. And that line is something that would be agreed in terms of the delegated powers. Where does it stop being just a, a function and where does it start being strategic? Clearly, a house is a function. A power station is a strategy. So where is that line? A housing estate? A new town? I don't know. I'm not going to say where it is, but that is laid out in this document to say precisely where that is. And that's part of the reason we have these governance documents to say what we are going to do. And in this particular case, the board has fully delegated powers. It can do anything it wants, but not in planning and licensing. It can do anything it wants with this stuff. So there are specific things that it takes charge of. So if there's something about day services for older people, integrated joint board, not the cabinet, not the health board, but the integrated joint board, it's their responsibility. As with so many of these public sector things, but also with other organisations, there is legislation that you have to follow. So to say it might be legislation on declaring your finances to Companies House. Here there are other uh, legislative frameworks that have to be followed, and it's very specific about what they are, what the Act is, and what that then, what knock-on effects that has for this body. So again, it's very clear on that. Section 12AZA, it's very, very specific. Well, that's all the legislation that surrounds this body and what they have to do. And anyone who sits on this body should have at least a working knowledge of what these things are and what the consequences are. So you remember I said before, uh, when we're talking about this module and, and your assessment, I've chosen half a dozen different acts, health and safety at work, you know, that kind of stuff, because they are fairly broad based and, and come under a lot of things. I could have chosen the Care of Scotland Act 2016, but of course that's a very specific act for a very specific sector. But if you happen to be on this board, I would kind of want you to know about the Care of Scotland Act and the rights and responsibilities that it confers. Those are the specific acts, and then it talks about a wider range of legislation. How local government works, how care works, the Equality Act, the Human Rights Act, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So you're not just talking about Scottish legislation, you're talking about international legislation. And you're talking about responsibility. So again, part of the reason I chose this one is because there are very specific responsibilities and they are conferred on a person. 
And if something goes wrong, it actually ends up at their doors because it's important that you have accountability. For the integrated joint board, there are two of these people actually. So there is the chief officer. Um, and they will be responsible for the workings of that board. Underneath that, you'll have a, a chief social worker who's responsible for the social work stuff. And also a chief financial officer. You'll see this a lot in local government. It's always called Section 95 officer. They are basically responsible for the finances, for the public finances. Do they work? And so you'll, you'll sometimes see issues about, uh, you know, somebody will stand up and say, oh, well, we should spend this money. And a Section 95 officer will stand up and say, uh, no, I don't recommend you spend this money because that means that our reserves, the amount of money we have to spend, uh, if something goes badly wrong, that would drop our reserves before below 2.5%. And therefore, in terms of the local government Scotland Act 1973, this would be a very bad move for this organisation. Now, that's then still a choice. There's no point in keeping reserves all the time, but it is up to the people in charge. It's up to the people who govern that organisation when that point comes. So if somebody turns up and says, uh, by the way, um, there's a pothole outside a doctor's office. Can we go into the reserves to fix that pothole? No. Don't think so. If someone turns up and says, uh, if someone goes to Florida and says, by the way, there's been a hurricane, uh, we're kind of short on beds and places to put them, can we dip into the reserves to stop people dying? Yeah, OK then, that seems reasonable. And again, it's about that line. Where is that line between this is what we should do, this is what we want to do, and this is what we absolutely have to do? And no matter whether it's here in terms of health or social care or any other aspect, you always have to make that decision. Do I hire someone else to stand behind the counter in my shop? Well, I would like to do it. Do I have to do it? Can I afford to do it? Those are different questions. So those governance choices are made all the time. Happy with that bit? OK, so this is governance from you know, the, the sharp end of that triangle. But actually, somebody actually has to do the work. So there are other, well, that was a nice wee smile from Margaret. Yeah, and you recognise that, don't you? People actually have to do it. <laughs> so there's a scheme of delegation. So here it's called a scheme of delegation to officers, but it could be a delegation to you know, heads of division or shop managers or whatever it happens to be for your organisation. So here's a scheme of delegation to officers and it says here's what specific people can do. And again, I'm not going to go through all of these. These documents are in are available to you so you can have a look at them. So I'll pick out a, a couple of things. The first is that it's about this idea of governance. Governance is about setting an aim, but implementation for that goes to other people. And we have to give the people that are doing that powers to make decisions. Hello, Mr. Shop Manager. Have you hired the new person for your shop? Well, if you're the chief executive of McDonald's or the chairman of the board of McDonald's, you don't really want to make that decision. You have to delegate that further down the chain. So you leave it up to the shop manager or the McDonald's manager to say, yeah, we need more staff. I am going to do that. But if the question was, oh, we're doing really well, will we open another shop? You probably didn't delegate that to the shop manager but you might have delegated it to the regional director who looks after a whole region. 
to say, okay, well, look at look at the figures here. We could actually open another shop and make more money. And the same thing happens in all sorts of organisations. You have to delegate the powers to ensure that they can actually perform the day-to-day -day business of the organisation. Um, and that delegation, so I've just said, you delegate powers here, the chief executive and or the appropriate chief officer will be responsible for the appointment of all posts below the level of chief officer. And that's a lot of words that say, if you're in governance, you will appoint the person at the top and the people under them. But under that, that's up to the people managing it. So you will hire the managers, but the managers are then given freedom underneath that. So it starts off by saying, these are things that will never be delegated, powers reserved. You cannot do this no matter what. And it's saying things like if the council, if the board, if the government, whatever the body is, if they make a decision, management can't say, ah, oh, no, I'm not interested in that. They have to go along with the aim of the organisation as expressed by that top level, whatever that level is. Having said that, things happen. So it does say, look, if something's happened that's really urgent, and this might go against what we would normally do, maybe we can all get together. And here it specifies the chief executive, the leader, and the portfolio holder. So that, that Florida thing that I was talking about, well, we don't have the money. Maybe the chief executive, the leader, and the portfolio holder for social care can get together and say, yeah, these are exceptional circumstances. We know this isn't our normal policy, but we need to get involved here. If that happens, they can make the decision, but it still has to be reported back. It doesn't happen in isolation. So a report goes back. It also talks about what powers are reserved for particular parts. So particular committees, and I spoke earlier about licensing, doing licensing stuff, planning, doing planning stuff. And a whole lot of that is um, governed by statute. And there's a whole list of things here. And again, it's there's an awful lot of statutes for this public organisation. There may be fewer for your organisation, but they will still be there. And you have to understand what they are. That's the statutory ones. There are non-statutory reservations. Things that you wouldn't delegate. Things like, what's the budget for this year? You don't delegate that to a subcommittee. You may get a subcommittee together to start looking at the budget, to start thinking about the general approach, how it might happen, but the actual final decision has to be taken by everybody. Not surprisingly, because it's a, it's a big thing. This is the budget we have for the year. Um, so whole pile of things that are never delegated. And then it starts talking about restrictions. And not surprisingly, the first one of those is about budget. And it's saying, um, if the budget is going to be bust, you need to talk to somebody. If you are in McDonald's and you had approval to open that new shop, then that new shop is going to cost £100,000. I have no idea how much it costs to open a shop. That is going to cost £100,000 and you've now found out it's going to cost £120,000. You might want to report that back and get permission to exceed the budget. I'll tell you right now that all over the country, there are people running back to the budgets and looking at the inflation levels and saying, well, two months. <laughs> I've seen Margaret. Yeah, yeah, me too, Margaret. Believe me. Budgets that were set six months ago 
are now suddenly 10% less because of inflation. And what do we do? How do we how do we fix that gap? And it might be a revenue budget. How do we how do we uh, pay people? Because pay deals have gone higher than we expected because inflation has gone higher than we expected and people need to live. So it might be on that revenue side. It might be on capital side. You might be in the middle of building a new GP surgery that last year was budgeted to cost half a million. And this year, if you can get the stuff, is now budgeted to cost 750,000. And that is the kind of inflation rate we're seeing in building at the moment. So the first thing in the, on the exercise of delegated powers is, yeah, if you're going to break the budget, you might want to talk to us first. In fact, do that. Honestly. You also might want to do it where something is controversial. And that's more of a subjective thing, of course. If you're going to do something that's controversial, if you're going to close a, a McDonald's in a town, if you're going to close the last post office or the last bank in a town, you might have delegated powers to do it, as part of the bank's delegated powers. But if it's a last bank and somebody then suddenly has to travel 70 miles to do their banking, you might want to talk to people before you make that decision. Because that's going to have knock on effects elsewhere. It's not just about closing the bank, it's about your customers and what they're going to have to do. Let's not beat about the bush, it's also going to be about publicity and what's going to happen when you close down that last service. So before you do something that's technically under delegated powers, if it's going to be controversial, you may want to talk it through and see whether the organisation wants to take on that controversy. So there's a lot of that kind of thing and a lot of stuff about legislation and saying you need to keep up with legislation and also about sub-delegation. I've given you the job to do this, you've given the, someone else that same job, and so on down the chain. It says what happens if people aren't around. Who steps in? Somebody walks under a bus. Who makes the decisions while they're in hospital for three months? And then how delegation works. So generally, generally you get power over your bit, the bit that you're managing. And it's explicit about that meaning that you get the powers to actually make sure that that department works. You get powers to appoint people. You may, you have powers to decide when people are going to be given leave. If you run the accounts department, you probably don't want your staff going on holiday in March because year end is often the end of March. So if you suddenly decide, oh yes, yeah, well, what you want to go away all during March, not a problem. No, not a good idea. So you might be given delegated powers to say, no, you can't take a holiday in March because we need to do this stuff. If I put in a holiday just now for next week, somebody would come back to me and go, no, no chance. You've got students. You can't just leave your students. So you get these kinds of uh, delegated powers to ensure that you can actually perform the business of the organisation. And they're explicitly written up over many years. All the things that have happened. And then there are specific ones, so specific ones for the chief executive who has strategic management. Specific ones for. Can't scroll fast enough. Head of service, democratic services, which is the fancy way of saying it's a solicitor and they know about the law. And here's what they're responsible for. They're responsible for legal services. They're responsible for democratic services. 
they're clearly not responsible for services to grammar, judging by that. But um, they are responsible for communications and civil contingencies. So we're back to Florida again. So the head of service for that is responsible for those kinds of things. So it explicitly sets out what they're responsible for, the legislation that uh, that has surrounding it, and what they do within each of those sections. Here's what they do for licensing. They have to understand the Zoo Licensing Act 1981 and the Riding Establishments Act 64 and 70. Who knew? Why do you need two acts for riding establishments? I mean, OK. So it's extremely explicit in what they have to know about and what they have to manage. And if you go through the document, you'll see similar things for other managers, which bits they are responsible for. And you can see those pages and pages of this. We haven't even got on to the next person yet. We have doing sections, wouldn't it? So head of services, democratic services starts at page 16. The next one starts at page 27. So there's 11 pages of this is what you're responsible for. This one starts at page 27 and going through meteorology and non-automatic weighing instruments, public health, goes all the way through from page 27 to page 46. 20 pages of stuff that they are responsible for. So you get the idea. This stuff is saying, here's what it's your job to do. Now, they won't do all that themselves. They will have people under them. And again, they will have their own delegated powers about which part they do. They are responsible for dog control, for example. That may be someone's specific task. So there's all these delegated powers so that the, the stuff that happens, this is what this organisation wants to do, can then be implemented and they're given powers to implement that. Earlier on, we said that one of the things that came up in the council plan was that the economy wanted to be, we want to look at the economy and we want to look at employability. Well, front and centre, there's there are about economy. They're about employability, and that's what they're responsible for. So these things aren't just about grabbing stuff here and there. It's about that golden thread again. We have said we're going to do this. These are our aims. This is what we want to put forward, and this is who's responsible for it. And that thread runs through the whole thing. Any questions about that? I'm not going to go through all 79 pages of this. Either there's no questions or nobody's listening anymore. Margaret's taking notes, I can see that. OK, so that's for the council. And because we've been talking about it, there's a similar thing for the IJB. Here's the scheme setting out powers for officers for the integrated joint board. And again, if we look at the sections, no, there's no sections. It's talking about the chief officer, the chief finance officer. You remember I mentioned that before, the section 95 officer who's responsible for the budget. There's a chief social work officer who's responsible for specific things as well. So all these delegated powers are all laid out. The legislative framework in which they must work is all laid out. So that anybody can come back and go, what is this to do with me? OK, so that's taking it from strategic aims to implementation. And I want to finish off just by talking about a couple of um, related matters. So one of the things is, um, one of the things that's often delegated is procurement. And again, it's that idea about there being a line. 
Do you want to go back to the board of directors to buy a new pen? No. Do you want to go back to the board of directors to build a new uh, headquarters? Yeah. And again, the question is, where amongst that continuum is what you do? And in fact, for that scheme of delegation, one of the things that was in there, come on computer, you can do it. Now, trust me, one of the things that's in there is actually a spending limit. So if you're a chief officer, you can spend, say, £100,000 or £300,000. And if you're a, a sub manager, you can spend £50,000. So there are limits to what people can spend depending on where they are in the organisation, quite rightly, because they need to manage that organisation and need to have spend and not every last budget item has to go all the way up the chain and all the way back again, because how could you run an organisation in that way? But where you do have to go outside, where you do have to do contracts, it's all also useful to have rules around that. And I think I mentioned it last week in a, a fairly, um, I was, yeah, it was window cleaning I was talking about. And you were talking about, I was talking about, if you need the windows cleaned, how do you get that window cleaner? Do you give it to your brother-in-law's, do you give it to your brother-in-law who has a, a ladder, a bucket and a, a chamois? Or do you put it out to tender to make sure you're getting the best service at the best price? So quite often you will have rules for doing that. How do we decide who gets what can be quite large contracts? These are all laid out. How you go out to tender, how you judge the tenders, how you decide which one is best, very much in inverted commas. Because that's a skill in itself. You could go out to the shops and you could buy. Oh, gosh, what could you buy? You could buy a pair of trousers. Now, you could go to Primark and buy those trousers or you could go to Hugo Boss and buy those trousers. Which is the best? I don't know. If you are buying a pair of trousers to go work in a garage and lie under a car, pre-mark. If you are um, attending a red carpet event at a film premiere, you go boss. But how do you decide beforehand? One of the things you might want to do in tenders is to see how you will judge them. Now, clearly one of them is going to be price. Same as price, the price difference between Primark trousers and Hugo Boss trousers. But that doesn't tell you everything. So you will set out criteria for how you will judge the tender. What the quality effects are. And you'll decide what's important. If you're setting out a tender where there's going to be, well, if you're sending out a tender that says we need to uh, put on extra ferries, would you, for example, accept a tender from a com company that didn't actually have any ferries? Now, this one would say no. The Westminster government four years ago would say, oh, absolutely. Putting these things in place before you do the tender makes it a lot easier to have a transparent process and say, here's why we made a decision. Here's why we chose this company that bid at 110,000 rather than this company that bid at 90,000. It was because they have a better track record of delivery. It's because they have ISO um, quality um, the, the ISO quality mark against their company. It's because they have a track record of delivering these kinds of services. Or it might be more, um, it might be a choice you make not on a, a quantitative 
thing, but in a qualitative thing. We've got these two tenders. They're very similar, but one is from a company that lives 200 miles away, and one is from a company that's down the road. Well, maybe you decide that one of your criteria is, well, we want to, we want to stay local. We want to help local companies. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you set it out beforehand and you say that is one of that is one of the criteria that we're going to use. The criterion of locality is important in this tender. If you don't put that out, if you don't see how you're going to do it, the other company can go, well, hang on, why have you chosen them just because they're, they're down the road? Oh, because we want to do that. Well, no, this is a public sector contract. You can't do that. You can't change your mind afterwards. It's easier in private sector because you can spend your money the way you want, same as you can choose to spend your money at pre or Hugo Boss. Well, personally, I don't because I couldn't afford to go to Hugo Boss, but you get the idea. So it's about setting out these things beforehand. It's about that transparency. And so is this last thing that I wanted to talk about. Well, actually, it's not the last thing, but we're not going to have time to do the other thing I wanted to talk about, so we'll do that next week instead. And it's again about this transparency thing and about tenders and about how things work. And it's about the window cleaning job. If you want to have transparency, people who serve on your board or on your government or on your council or on your whatever it is, your committee, might perhaps want to have a a code of conduct that includes a register of interests. And that register of interests might say something like, I have a 20% shareholding in my brother-in-law's window cleaning business. And if that 20% shareholding is in conflict with the, the contract that you give them for that a window cleaning business, maybe there's an issue here. Maybe there's a conflict of interest. And definitely people would want to know about it. I also mentioned last week about um, contracts at every layer of an organisation. And I mentioned that the number of books and pens, uh, notepads and pens and things that I would receive in a previous life when I uh, was an IT director. Because they were below the threshold that I had to register. So they knew they could send me as many USB drives, journals, pens, whatever, and it was fine. They would just own my desk. But if they took me out to dinner, if they took me to a, a Scotland match, that had to go on a register of interests. And it had to say things like, um, I have a register, I have an interest in this other company. So I serve on your board, but I have a, an interest in this other company. And when I am making the decision, you might want to know about that. I have an interest in this house. Why do you care? This is the integrated joint board. Why do you care if the people on the board have a house? Well, if they're making a decision about closing one health centre against another, and the health centre that they're keeping open is in their town, and the health centre that they're closing is in the town down the road, is there a conflict of interest there? There may not be, but at least this way you know the background to the decision being made. So I'm absolutely not suggesting that this is how it would work. I'm saying that transparency is key. Okay. That is me for the day. Um, it wasn't intended to be because I did mention earlier on about um, part of the reason we're doing this is to try and make our organisation better. So I do have a, a, a presentation about uh, PDCA, Plan Do. Oh, good to see people nodding. It, it's about basically doing planning something, doing it, figuring out where it's worked and adjusting it afterwards to make it better if it hasn't. So I've got a presentation on that just to talk about why we do that. But I'm well aware of the time, so I'll, I'll 
pull that over to next week. I'm sure you'll be happy with that. So does anyone have any questions on any of that for today? OK, so I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, Tony, mm -hmm. I'm looking at all of uh, all of this details and uh, placing it side by side with the case study. Do we have to have all these details represented while we are treating the case study? That's a very good question. No, clearly this is at the very top end of what you have because this is about public sector, it's about lots of legislation, it's about a huge organisation with you know 7,000 people and half a billion in revenue. So this is at the very top end of what you want, what you need to do. And no, I do not expect that detail in your assessment. Um, so remember, your assessment is about a smaller company um, with fewer employees, and with less of a an assessment legislation, uh, an assessment uh, a legislation framework. I'll get it right yet. So I don't expect all of these details in terms of you know schemes of delegation and all that kind of stuff. But I would expect you to say that that's a thing that they should consider. So this is a starting document, if you like. Here's the sort of things you will need to consider. Um, so I'm just um, looking at the assessment and it says explaining your suggested governance, risk and compliance strategy. So it's what you want to do. So it might say, for example, it's important to have clear lines of delegation in terms of decisions being made and in terms of money being spent. And here's why. But I wouldn't expect you to have that scheme of delegation nor to have those numbers in place. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. It does. Th okay. Then one more question. Uh -huh. uh, I was uh, looking at the materials and I, I, I felt that uh, since this company is stated to be in Scotland yes. and there is a code of conduct for business for Scotland, yes. like one of your materials stated for code of conduct for, for business in, in, in England, is it possible if um, will one be penalized lifting some of those code of, code of conduct since OSEC um, principle is not cannot be changed since they are using a specific standard code? If it is lifted from the code of conduct from Scotland and is used in, your, in the material for submission, OPA, there's not going to be a penalty for that. OK, so there's, there's actually about three different questions in there. So let me try and answer them individually. So the one is about a code of conduct that specifically mentions Scotland, and you're saying that there's codes of conduct for England. Yes, there are. And you can use any of those because what you're doing is, is recommending what this organization should do. So you're not um, you're not restricted to just Scotland. The reason that Scotland is mentioned is actually to do with compliance. It's to do with legislation. Now remember, I'm not going to cover legislation, but one of the things I will say about legislation is there are different legislative frameworks. So there is a Scottish legislative framework. There is the UK legislative framework. And there are still some things that refer to European legislative framework. So the reason I've specifically mentioned Scotland is that anything for that you put in for compliance should be for Scotland. So you can't say, oh, you've got to comply with the Belarusian legislation. No, you don't. You're in Scotland. You need to comply with the legislation that applies in Scotland. So for the things like that, it has to be Scotland, where you're making a recommendation. No, you can bring in things from other places. And your third question was about, will you be penalised for using them? You won't be penalised for using them, but what you do have to do 
is reference them. So again, I spoke about this in the first week. So there's the bit where um, I'm trying to make this as uh, real life as possible, but I'm also under constraints because this is also an academic subject. So again, I've said in the assessment that, in fact, I'll just put it on the screen for you just to show you. The appendices must follow proper academic practice for reports and be fully referenced in the UWS style. So part of that is what you were saying. You won't be penalised for using it, but you do have to reference it. You do have to say this came from this document and you have to do that in the UWS style. Um, and part of the reason I have to do this is because actually, and it doesn't even matter if you're doing the MSc or the CPD, you will get academic credits for this and those academic credits can build up. So I still have to make it an academic part. So sorry for those of you in business or you know outside the university. I'm sorry I'm having to make you do referencing, but I do have to do it in order to give you those credits. So uh, you have to reference and I've put in a whole bunch of stuff in there about referencing and how you do it and how it works. And I'm happy to answer questions if, you, if you're not sure about it. So go and have a look at how you do that. But the bottom line is you say this comes from the Scottish Code of Conduct written by in this date and as long as you put that in the document and expressly say that you're quoting from it that is absolutely fine if you just grab the text from that document or any other and just chuck it in your report that is not fine and that will be penalized so those two different things there. is that okay very okay thank you so thank you so much no problem. one last question is uh, from uh, the previous week we uh -huh. are having a debate about um, either to submit in three or once. Yes. So I think we need to conclude with that because I want to ask a question re regarding that. Because if we are to submit in three parts, today you've started talking about management. Um, uh, my basic question was that uh, if we are submitting for governance, uh, does governance also, are we going to cover these phases too? in terms of um, implementation and day-to-day -day running of activities under governance? That's my question. Well, I hope that's what we've just done. So that's what I've been talking about today. So the, the governance includes setting the, the aims, but then they also have to be implemented. And that's what I was talking about today in terms of um, schemes of delegation and uh, frameworks for implementation and KPIs. So that's what we've been doing today. Um, in terms of your first point, you're quite right, and I'm glad you reminded me. I put out the poll last week. Not everyone has answered it. And the question was whether you wanted one submission or three submissions. And it's it's roughly 70, 30 that you want three submissions. So I'm happy to do that. Um, what I will do is I will come up with some dates because what I don't want to do is say, by the way, you're submitting next week. So I'll come up with some dates where those come in and I'll give you at least a fortnight uh, between me giving you the date and the submission due in. So I will, as we spoke about before, there will be a governance submission. So that's only 20% and that will hopefully let you get the feel of the submission and it will allow me to give you some feedback on that. Then there will be the risk submission. And that will be 20%. And again, it's a slightly bigger one to make sure that you're getting the right stuff. And then the final one will be the last 70%. All the other stuff. With the exception that. I am not going to give you the marks in governance or risk management for the professionally presented report. In other words, I'm not going to, I'm going to mark the content and not the presentation, but I will certainly be giving you feedback on presentation. And I will do that 
when I will give you the marks when you present your final report. Um, on the other hand, I do want it properly referenced. And I will build up those marks as we go along. So I will take off marks if you don't properly reference for each of them. The final submission, so even though I'm splitting it up into three, the final one where you add in these bits, the, the compliance control and, and some other bits and pieces. Um, when you do that final submission, I'm actually going to ask you to submit the whole report. I'm going to ask you to go back, get your governance bit, get your risk bit and put them all together in one final report. But I'll only mark the bits that you're putting in. And the reason I'm doing that is because clearly this all fits together. So it would be kind of silly to not have them together. So yeah, we'll do three submissions because that seems to be what the class want to do, but I will give you at least two weeks to be, between me saying this is a, the submission and, and you having to put that in. So at the moment, looking at it, I haven't quite finished. Um, oops, I haven't quite finished governance. I do have one wee thing and I'll do that next week, which is the sixth. So I'm suggesting that this submission will be on the 20th for governance. I then hope to finish risk on the 13th, which would mean that the submission I don't really want to give you two submissions one week and then the second week. So rather than saying the 27th, I'll probably say the 3rd of November and then the final one at the end, as we discussed at the start. Does that sound sensible, reasonable? Um, I really am open to discussion on this. I mean, clearly we have to get assessments, we have to get them in before the end of term. But other than that, I'm, I'm open to discussion if that's if that doesn't sound reasonable. Sorry, Tony, can you hear me? It's Nicola. Yeah. Um, the only day I caught there was the 20th for governance and then my computer broke up again. It's been awfully choppy this afternoon. Uh, my, my suggestion was risk then two weeks after that. So rather than giving you assessment and then assessment the next week, I'll propose to give you a break. <laughs> so the 20th and then the 3rd of November. So two weeks between them, and then there would then be another three weeks before the final assessment, just to space them out a wee bit. That sound reasonable? Thank you. Everyone happy with that then? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Right. OK, so I'll update the syllabus for that and I'll put those dates in. I'm getting some thumbs up. Thank you, Anthony. Any other questions just now? Or comments? Abuse? Request to see the cat? Margaret? Um, I was just going to say as a CPD student rather than a a cybersecurity student um, and probably one of the elderly members of the group. But anyway, um, I was just going to ask. Oh, I was just going to ask about um, IT background. So, I mean, obviously um, the learning and this and the, the sessions so far are, are what are really, really interesting for me and that I'll be able to apply in my job. But um, and uh, I, I totally get. I mean, the academic side and 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 doing the the, the that piece of work. But uh, I suppose the bit that's most on my mind is I am not an IT professional, yep. um, but everything has been so relevant uh, to date as I expected it would be. I'd obviously read the the details before I started, and I'm sure there might be other people in a similar position. But my background's not IT at all, yep. um, and I'm just I'm just thinking about that in terms of expectation. Um, you know, I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that, really. <laughs> Acutely aware, and it, it's a very good question. Um, so there's a couple of things. So I do try and keep it um, 
not IT focused, and clearly it is from an IT MSC that we're doing this, but actually the only things that are IT specific are these things here, ITIL and COBIT. And even then, although they are IT specific things, they're actually more about project management. So it's actually more about we have a need. How do we fulfill that need? What are the steps we should go through to make sure that we're doing it properly? So they're IT focused, but they're actually more about the process of doing anything. So even though they, so they're the specific IT things, and I'm aware that they're there, but I do try and uh, put that out. And they are only, you know, 5% each in the marking scheme. And as I said, it will actually be helpful even if you don't have the IT background. The other thing is in terms of the submission. So as you know, it's the case study. And as you also know, I gave the option if you'd prefer not to use a case study to use your own employment. But further than that, uh, the only other one is um, here, where I said, you should pay particular attention, but not limit yourselves to IT issues. Now, clearly that was for the, the IT students. For me, so that you're aware, I am aware of the background of other people, and that's where the do not limit yourself to. Um, so I am more than happy that you use other things other uh, aspects. So I'm asking the IT students to think about it from an IT point of view, but I'm asking other students to think of it in terms of a more general point of view. So yes, I, I am aware and I'm, I will not punish you because you're not starting to tell me that a, a huge risk is not having a firewall because you don't know what a firewall is. But my cyber security students absolutely will. And if and so that if you're listening, if you don't talk about a risk by not having a firewall, I'll be very upset. On the other hand, if you don't tell me a risk about a lack of appropriate staff, I'll be wondering if you haven't really thought about the risk issues around. So yes, I am aware and yes, I will not be focusing in IT for the CPD side. And as I say, if you want to actually not even use an IT based case study, if you want to do it for your own uh, employment, I'm happy to talk about that as well. And, and someone already has. And I don't know if you're in the meeting, but I will get back to you um, to discuss that further. Is that OK? Is that your mind at rest a wee bit? Yeah, that's really, really helpful, Tony. Thank you very much. I mean, I think I, I'm just conscious that it it is very much about the learning for me. And you're, I, I was just like, I don't want to do, you know, I didn't want to do this kind of course of service by by pretending I was something I was not. No. So it was just it was just highlighting that. But thank you. No, absolutely understood. And actually, see if you speak to the IT people on this course, they'll be saying, why do we need to do GRC at all? Because it's not about IT and yet of course it is because it's about everything it's about it all it's about organizations and how the organizations work and how all that stuff fits in um, and my IT students tend, tend to say well why are we doing it at all because until you've been in that kind of organization where that stuff happens and I know that you absolutely have it doesn't seem relevant but once you're in that kind of organization it is absolutely central to the sorts of things that you have to do so for the students, what we are trying to do is give them this awareness before they get to that point. And not, uh, and it's certainly not a small part of it, that actually for the IT students, see if you go and look at jobs that have been advertised in IT, go and look for things like cybersecurity with a particular reference to GRC. And you'll see not only that there are lots of jobs out there, they pay significantly more. And that isn't just an IT. If you understand these kinds of stuff, this kind of stuff and can apply it, it's really helpful in any career, I think, which is why we've got all you CPD guys here. 
But yes, I, I take the point, Margaret, you don't need to worry about it. You will absolutely not be penalised. I absolutely understand that is the bottom line. Any other questions just now? Um, hi, Tony. Hi. I have a little question. It's not really related to the assessment or anything. It's more of yeah. or less in the general government sense. And it's about um, when new issues arise, like you see the window cleaner example you used often, when you say if the window cleaner is your brother-in-law, uh, it, it could fall under a conflict of interest. Yep. But say, what if the window cleaner has been hired, or he wasn't you? He wasn't someone you knew when you hired him, and mm -hmm. then over maybe his contract is a five-year contract, and in two years he then marries a family member of yours, and then becomes your brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. That kind of um, issue now becomes a conflict of interest because maybe in the company's um, in the company's uh, rules and regulations family members are, are not supposed to be oh we've lost you i think oh you're back here sorry we lost you for a wee bit there oh okay <laughs> so yeah i we've lost you again but i think i've got the, the point that you're making and it is a, a good point so and again there's different parts to it so yeah. The organisation may not allow uh, employment or contracts with family members. Absolutely. Yes. But hopefully any organisation that has that in their uh, documents will also have the clause as to what happens when they become family members after they get the contract. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, that would be a good time to put that into it's their documents. Amendment. And I think I, I said to you when I was pointing out those other documents that were quite long, they didn't just appear overnight, they were continually added to, they're continually updated, and they are continually updated. Mm. The other part to the question is after the five years, and that's where it comes back to a, a clear, straightforward tendering process. Because I actually don't have any problem with family members being employed. I have a problem with family members being employed where there is no competition, where people don't know that they're family members, and where there has been no clear process showing how they have got that contract. So if the person who makes the decision has made a, a declaration of interest that they know this person, that they have shares in it, but the tendering process was put out and they're saying we're going to go 25% on cost, 25% quality, 25% on locality, 25% on, uh, I think I've done quality, haven't I? But you get the idea. As long as that's been set out beforehand and all the tenders that come in have been marked on those uh, headings. And again, the, the, the marking scheme should be clear before it happens too. As long as all that has been gone through and they are the best person, that's absolutely fine because you don't want the opposite to happen either. You don't want people to be disqualified because they happen to know people. That would be unfortunate. What you don't want is a conflict of interest to disadvantage your organisation. And I would argue that not giving a contract simply because you do know them or there is some relationship, not giving them that. Um, simply because of that relationship is actually as bad for the organisation because you're not getting the best person or it's not the best price or whatever. So again, it's about finding that balance, trying to find out where that line is. Mm -hmm. But each organisation will deal with it in its own way. And again, part of what we're trying to do here is think about exactly those things. So it's good that you're thinking about that and how those things might be fluid and how they might change. But it's up to the organisation to decide, no, this is our approach to it. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it makes perfect sense. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. I'm seeing a thing in the chat saying, can we extend the final <gasps> submission to the end of November, around the 30th? 
Um, what do we think? Part of the reason I have it at that date is to have, and it's actually less for the CPD people and more for the MSC people. I'm aware that you have other modules, and quite often what happens is that the submission dates for those tend to be towards weeks 12, 13. So what I try and do for this one is get this in first so that you don't have all those competing things. Because if I move it on to the, the 30th of November, you're suddenly going to have all those other assessments due in at once. What I'm trying to do is stagger them. So that's why it's there. And I know that the temptation is to put it as far away as possible. But actually what I'm hoping you're doing is writing this report as you go along. I'm not I'm hoping that you're not starting this on the 21st of November for a 24th of November turn in. I'm hoping you've already started it, in fact. So I would be resistant to extending the deadline, but I am open to persuasion. So if anybody wants to persuade me, please feel free to do so. Or if anyone absolutely would not want to persuade me, please also feel free to do so. And if nobody cares, just stay quiet, stay quiet and don't say anything. Right, OK, I'm going to leave it at the 24th just now. If there are arguments, stick them into Teams and we can talk about it on Teams because I'm also acutely aware it's 20 past one and I was supposed to have finished 20 minutes ago. And I think some people have already left for other meetings. And I can't say I blame them. Are there any other questions just now? Because I don't want to leave you without answering all your questions. OK, what I'll do now is, yeah, OK, Margaret, thank you. Bye bye. I'm going to stop the recording just now.